Good morning. It's um, so this is the ontology working group session. Uh, it's mostly going to be a conversation. So I'm just going to do a little bit review of what we've been doing for the past year. But mostly we want to hear from you um, and have a conversation more so than me presenting. So I'm not good at it. All right. So the first part of the discussion will be I will give you a year in review. Then we'll have a community discussion. And then what we'll do is try to maybe prioritize some of the things that we talked about to help us guide our next, uh, our future work. Uh, so one of the first things that we did uh, was to create a mission statement. So we would have some type of guidance for the work that we did. And we centered our mission around three things, sustainability, advancement and outreach. So for sustainability, we're mostly talking about things that make it easier for us to ingest, manipulate, um, and share ontologies with, with little effort so that it wasn't so hard for all the different ITB2 sites to, to use and share ontologies. For advancement, we were making, um, we're gonna make some recommendations on how to do more advanced ontologies, um, interoperability with other networks, and try to improve the usefulness within the translational research environment. And then the last thing we're doing is a lot of outreach, trying to share what's out there already, and then um, make people aware of what's available and make it give people a platform for sharing their I2B2 ontologies. Um, the next thing we did was we did a bit of sharing. So we shared uh, resources in terms of documentation. Matfi had a uh, had created some training materials, and other people had contributed to it. So we did that, and then we had a series of demos where we had Kavi came and demonstrated his ETL to ontology tool. Um, we had Niche who created this really cool, uh, like kind of real-time ontology editor. It's not yet public, but hopefully it'll be coming soon. And, and then Mike shared Lori's work with the BioPortal conversion tools that allow you to take BioPortal ontologies and turn them into I2B2 ontologies. So I, uh, the links are here. And uh, for Mike's demo, we do have uh, the recording of that where he walked us through how you use those bioportal tools and make uh, ontologies, I2B2s. The other thing we did was we uh, spent some time, like in the vein of sustainability, we wanted to create a way where it was really easy for people to ingest ontologies. And so we did some requirements and we came up with this concept of an I2B2 ontology store. Um, we hope that the community will move towards this. Uh, it has a, a JSON format with uh, a set of TSV tab separated files that represent your ontology and it'll allow you to um, post them to the cloud and then people will be able to ingest them directly into their I2B2 as long as they have admin privileges. Um, so they can pick and choose what ontologies they want to use and most of them, like for the ACT ontology, I think it only takes a half hour, whereas the process that we had been using in ACT, you know, it was very manual, and for some people it was taking days to get their ontologies in. So we're hoping that people um, will use this. Uh, I put the GitHub if you want to try to install it into your environment, um, and hopefully in the future it will be the way that I2B2 ontologies will uh, Move. So one of the things, the other things we're going to do with this is actually try to populate it with some of the common bioportal ontologies. We'll have the ACT ontology um, in, in the store available for people so they can just download easily. Uh, so that was pretty much my presentation. <laughs> so um, the, the thing we've been doing uh, lately is actually having some discussions because we're trying to figure out how to share and um, experiences, challenges, tips and tricks 
uh, with ontology metadata management. So that's one of the things we've been talking about in working group, but we did come up with this whole list of things that um, we can talk about. And I want you guys to talk. I do not want to talk. Uh, so that's why we changed the room configuration. So these are all our topics that you can pick from or you can just introduce your own. So there it is. And he will give you a mic and you could Hello, become uh, if you want to. Uh, hi, I'm, I'm Ulrich from Göttingen, Germany. So I've got two questions from uh -huh. an international uh, point of view. Uh, because uh, the first one is uh, the Dosa Act is not really known in, in, in Germany, so in Europe. Right. So. <clears throat> and uh, I think it's very useful, and uh, the, the question would be how to communicate this, because it's an absolutely useful collection of, you know, classification standards. Uh, in the end, it's just for populating your tree on the left side, right. to have all the right categories uh, to map the ETL in. And, and some people are confused with the term ontology, because, you know, they think of biomedical um, ontologies. Mm -hmm. but I think this is absolutely useful in communication. Uh, maybe you should just tell it's the tree on the left side where you the put tree on things the left in and, and the classification nomenclatures. Um, and uh, we got the same thing uh, going on in Germany and parts of Europe, and it's uh, the uh, fire implementation guides. It looks pretty similar. I saw the same act categories. You know, it's, it's medicines, it's right. medication, you got demographics, it, it's, you got labs. It's, it's all the same, but it's all fire in a fire store. The question would be, um, are there fire representations um, of that, or is different projects? This is OMOB, as I saw, and there's a mapping going on. So the ACT ontologies and the ontologies that I have now are not fire-based. But if somebody wants to show us how to do it in fire, we would really appreciate that. Um, ours are just the regular I2B2 table forms, um, and you mentioned calling them ontologies may put people, may be confusing for people. And I think in Shrine, they did try to make it a little bit more generic and calling it medical concepts. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, so when you look in the Shrine, even though they are act ontologies, they still are, it's labeled medical concepts. And so maybe that's more of a generic term, and I don't know, maybe we should adopt it more. In the new I2B2 UI, do you know what are, are they calling it ontologies, or what are they calling it? So terms. Terms, yeah. terms just terms. terms. Yeah, I think yeah. That's, yeah and, and we call it more, uh, terms is difficult as well. We, we're talking about information model sometimes, because you know it encompasses different concepts and the relation between the concepts, right. uh, and then uh, follow you know the classifications, uh, the nomenclatures in there. That helped us a lot in the discussion. Right. So just a heads up, uh, so we, we try to do this with the um, fire. And the second question, it's a more difficult one, because um, ingesting data, we realize that uh, sometimes it's not enough just to describe the concepts, but you know the, the data lineage. And we've been looking in some projects, um, which uh, metadata standards are there to describe where the data comes from, what it was the intended use. You know, building data is much different than curated research data. And we're looking into that, uh, mm -hmm. that uh, you could have some, some kind of quality term to tell this is building data, so watch out if something right. is not billable, might be not in there, or this is curated research data, and this is the source. Right. I think originally we did have modifiers in our ontologies, but it did t turn, tend to slow the queries down, and I don't know that people actually use them. so you could have like a diagnosis code but it would have you could use a modifier for billing and you know first diagnosis and all those different things um so at some point at one of these conferences we decided we would take them out so i don't know if people are interested in putting them back in but the problem is that it it does slow the query down a bit so and it will make it more complicated probably for um so i do for act i have created an omop like an act ontology over top of OMOP concepts and the same thing for over PCORI concepts, it would probably complicate that a bit as well. So I don't know. I, fair, fair enough. Yeah, yeah. Just, um, actually, I just want to ask a follow-up question for you, Ulrich. Is, um, are you referring to, I think maybe I was picking up on something in your question about communicating to the user some maybe warnings or notes about data sort of quality or data lag or data completeness or Data, mm -hmm. I guess what I'd call data characterization mm -hmm. within the UI. It's a, it's a more complicated question because it's, it's 
not really about the ontologies and how to get the you know the ontologies in the tree. It's some additional elements in in the, in, the, in the ontology describing where the data comes from. So, so tell me, are you, so like Mark saying, do you are you expecting that to be visible to the user or something for a developer? Because I will say, like when I create the um, my base ontologies, I create from YOMLS. So I just have some scripts that I run from YOMLS. I do put a lot of extra information in the com is it comment or. There's some fields over to the right that I've like crammed a bunch of information in. So like if you look in the act ontologies and you look at say the medication ontology, it'll tell you what the, you know, what level of medication is. Is it SCD, SCDF? So there's, and then I always do try to put over in that area, what is the source? Is it UMLS? Did I hand jam it? You know, just things like that. Yeah, so. Exactly. We thought about some minimum information about data lineage. So maybe 10 yeah. items to describe where it comes from, when it was imported. Yeah. And so the ones, also the ones that I build from UMLS, I put the AUIs in the paths. So you can take those and link them to concepts in UMLS, to CUIs, and then go from there. So, so there is some little hidden, hidden nuggets in there. Um, they're not advertised, but if you look at the files, you will see that stuff. Also, I just sort of got a note that I think you have to hold this microphone closer uh, in order for it to pick up, so. One approach we've taken for some um, items where this fits well is we've um, used a folder at the top of the subtree, and we actually set its visual attributes to disabled, is that right? And then we put, uh, we did this for rurality uh, flags. So whether you live in a rural or a city environment, and there's a lot of different ways that can be encoded and determined. It's important for our end users to know which, which one we used. And so we actually put that as a disabled folder item right at the top. Um, it solves some of those issues, not all, but for some use cases, um, that definitely helps and it's, you know, performance, so. It has all the, like, the standard ontologies. Mm -hmm. But then, as I demoed the bio-ontology, there's a ton of other ontologies here. Is there any thought about maybe getting like a subset of the other ones that are not like the A list, but the B list, because Mary, for example, in the cancer, she's looking for a cancer ontology. So right. I worked with Mary a little bit, looking, trying to figure out which one. We kind of found one, but if there was like a B list and it said cancer, this one, that lots of people use, then it would have helped Mary because she'd be like, great, I'm right. using that one. Instead of being like, maybe I'll use this one, and it turns out that one really needs some help. Because it, yeah. it, it's. Doing it in the Right. So you're doing it in Excel. So I'm sure if Kavi was here, he'd be like, you need to use my tool to ETL this. Uh, uh, what's that? We just got a, a few comments in the Q&A oh. online, one of which is from Kavi. So. Oh, OK. I would say Kavi would want you to use his tool to create um, your ontology with his three column thing. M um, Muller did use it as uh, to create our <laughs> Are the newer SDOH ontology that we're going to have, but we haven't released it yet. But um, you might want to use that tool. The, and I will say, like, I'm calling these ACT ontologies because we did it, because ACT paid for it, right? So that's what you do. If somebody pays for it, you, call, you give them that branding. And, you know, it used to be Heinz Stadium, but it's ACT for sure today. So um, whoever pays for it, that's what, who gets the name. But I will say, you can use those ontologies not in ACT. The, the, the term ACT is actually in the table access table. So if you just change the name there, it won't say ACT ontology. Um, yeah, so <laughs> yeah, it can be just anything. Um, and it, that's what we want other people to donate ontologies that are in their domain area. That would be very helpful for networks and for other people. So um, yeah, if you guys have done some research on what's a good cancer ontology, we definitely would be interested in just consuming it and hopefully putting it in our ontology store so other people well, can yeah, download maybe, it. Yeah. Maybe just go through your subtools and figure out good ontologies that 
Yeah. Yeah. So, like, the A is the action to find like the details. And then if you want the secondary, you can go to that. And if you want, like, a really rich one, then you can do finance. Right. Yeah, yeah, those, yeah, just, I thought we were going to pick some of the really high use ones yeah, from BioPortal. G store, yeah, yeah. As soon as we get time, gosh, that's the only problem we have is time. So, so we will do it that way. Well, so for that one, you're right. Like, those concepts would be considered derived facts, which is another thing we've been talking about. Like, if people want to go ahead and compute these facts or have right. those you concepts. Can derive it from, but, but now we're talking about Right. But they do have a small subset, which I was thinking of putting in um, of the link to HBO one. So those will be. Uh, terms that are already in our databases right. and so we can do it, but it won't be the full way. set. So it's a Hokkien search. I'm using the space from Indiana now search against the registry. Is it really reasonable uh, standard to rely on, right? Everybody's collecting it. You have to report it to public health. And it's standard. And they're yanking the standards around every couple of years, especially lately. So you're like in, in a lot of uh, low-hanging fruit where it's not going to take a lot for us to ETL it into our I2B2s yes. and then it'll, yeah. And so that's what some of these are that we're planning to do for the startup of Act. Um, most of them are ones that are using concepts that are already in our database. So we'll have a C code one, we can put in a Cross and Mark comorbidity and an electrolyte because those depend on codes that are already existing within our systems, but it'll give you another perspective of the data. So that's kind of like where we're going with the act ontology. Go ahead. Is it my turn? Okay. It's, it's my turn. All right. So just, I, I wanted to follow up on uh, Matthew's comment. So there's this uh, very uh, cozy relationship between ontologies and ETL, which we might want to make even cozier. So a lot of times folks have great ideas of like new data they want to put in, but they don't know where to start with the ontology. And so they get kind of stumped, mm -hmm. and, they, and, and the data kind of doesn't really take because you know, they don't understand how to make it you know, into an ontology and so forth. And then there's a great ontologies, but there's no ETL that goes with it. And so you know, just what Matthew's saying there, you, know, you can't really take advantage of the great ontology, even though it could be very low-hanging fruit, right? Um, and it could be that there's lots of stuff available, and it would fit right in. So it, one of the things that could happen is that the ETL group and the ontology group, right, kind of like have this symbiotic relationship where every, when, 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 when like a, a second degree ontology or whatever we want to call that, right, 
is released, kind of ETL code or suggestions or something of that nature happens kind of at the same time. And they're kind of coupled together in a way, right? Now for the basic act ontology, you know, we don't need that because they already know it, right, in, in some ways, right? right? Although maybe we should do it because some people don't, not everybody knows it, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, even basic ETL would be good to kind of couple to the act ontology. But then for some of the newer ones, you know, it's kind of like becomes more obvious that, you know, don't start thinking about an ETL process unless you've like figured out the ontology, you know, or don't, you know what I mean? So that, um, that would really uh, promote, you know, um, this better understanding of, you know, the relationship between the ontology. And, and then there's this idea that, you know, even when you get an ontology and you do the ETL, you're only really interested in the, in the elements that have data associated with them, right? Mm -hmm. And so having a way to kind of, you know, do that, and I wish Jeff was here, I don't see him yet, but anyway, but <laughs> the idea there being, right, that, um, you know, the counts, you know, next to it, you know, and then making sure that, you know, that gets done. It's done every know, time, yeah. Because that's hard, right, to do that, those scripts that, you know, do the counts, but they are important, because then that. Right. Um, cool. It's an interesting, interesting point. What I am hearing coming so what I think we it's always been the approach that the analogy we're building now is scary. Kind of irrespective of the case. Right? If we want an analogy of diagnosis, we're going to use MLS and download the whole IP. We're not looking at our own code from the data and then really that's that's a different different story altogether. The standard the analogy is made out of standards. Interestingly, when Transmart came along, because the data sets were so custom, they came from Kai and each one was different, they couldn't really build that knowledge out of standards. They derived them from the data. So whatever questions that the trial asked for, that's what ended up in the analogy representing the data. So it was derived from the data. There was no separate that's that similar to what Mike's doing with the red cap, right? Exactly. Right, right. So, so you're you're right, Matthew, in that some of the initial stuff that we released with I2B2 did create the impression that like it had to be all standards based, right? And then later we actually added things like that clinical trials part and the ontology and stuff like in the demo stuff to show that no, the real strength here was that the ontology, right? You can basically drive the creation of new ontologies from the data. And that's exact and, and, and this actually is super important because a lot of stuff that we're all interested in doesn't have a standard, but that certainly doesn't mean it shouldn't be used in all of our algorithms and all that, right? It just means that there's no, you know, standard for it. But then Michelle can just in an instant create an ontology and now suddenly it becomes a first class citizen and you can use all those new concepts that aren't yet like in some kind of standards body for all kinds of research. And that's what research is kind of all about. Mm -hmm. So that's a, you know, it's really critical that we be able to have this creative flexibility mm -hmm. yeah, to create. But the, I, I think though it, you know, because for me, I look at it from a network perspective, it starts with the creative, but at some point we kind of have to figure out how do we harmonize it into something that, you know, other sites. Kind of the standards. Yeah, body yeah. And, and it might not Michelle, be standards solid. in terms of like concepts, but something that's harmonized in a way that we could share with other people and they could take advantage of that creative also, ontology as well. So you can derive it from data, but there are a couple of accoutrements that come from don't get from data, like higher Right? So if you have, I don't know, your drug that is presented by MDC. And you're going to have tens of thousands of codes. Who do not want to fly? Who's the first class? Because the researchers are going to want I don't know, data blocks. So you need to impose some optimization. And that will not come from data. That must come from some abstraction. Or synonyms. Um, Mark, oh, you don't want to do your question, Mark? Uh, no, actually, yeah, maybe we will. Like, Go ahead, Mark. Uh, sorry, Lyle. Um, he was we're going to give this a try. <laughs> uh, 
Kavi, can you try unmuting and seeing if yeah. can hear you? Yeah, can you hear me? And I think the answer is really uh, Are you able to hear me? OK, I wasn't sure. I can't hear you before. back in case. So um, in for case. folks okay. uh, that are on the Zoom, do try to use the chat, and I'll see if I can try to represent some of what you're saying in questions here. Uh, but I'm sorry, we're not able to get you on voice. And we hand the mic over here. So I'm Lau Patil from University of Kansas Medical Center. Um, so I'm engineer, so I, it's really nice to work with at ontology. It's, it's fun to work with it. Uh, but I'm going to speak through user experience. Um, so we have our own an ontology for last 10 years. And users are tends to wants to use those. Mm -hmm. So do you have any base practice guidelines how it should be incorporated with at? Let's say we are trying to put certain features into your at ontology, and we are trying to maintain at KU. Do you have any base practices? No. no. <laughs> I'm just going to be honest. Much. But that somehow confuses the users what to use. And so, so what we do end up is we just hide the at ontology and just use it for at. I wish we can use it for our local I2B2 as well. So you're talking about like the basic stuff, like the diagnosis, the procedures, the labs, and the meds? So the or diagnosis is pretty similar. Procedure is pretty similar. For example, demographics, we have date by SSA. Uh, death by epic um, so we have certain features which our end users are very used, used to. to right i don't know that, i guess that is actually one of the topics that was that data management So what's the technical answer to that, though? You know what I mean? Like, what is a, that's what we're trying to figure out. Like, what are the best practices? Because Mayo has a lot of their own ontology. Ocean has a lot of theirs. So they want to adopt some of it, but they want to mix and match the ones that they want to do. So like, what type of table structure or scripting do you use to be able to have these things where you don't clobber stuff? So that's one of the things that we did want to definitely want to talk about. Give him a mic. I can't see. Yeah, if we can pass a mic. Pass, he's passing. Yeah, he's, 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 he's not giving his up. Either one, folks. Folks on the Zoom can't hear you. So, so as far as the technical side, how would I approach that? Is what I do is I take the actatology because that's the biggest one, and then I'd start moving in the custom one into it, okay? And then I might give uh, the source system ID at the very end, like a unique name, maybe the name of my institution. And then what I'll do is I'll then export uh, as insert statements, anyone that has my source system ID as MGB, National Grant. And so that at that point, when Michelle releases a new one, I truncate everything, I reload it, all of Michelle's stuff, and then I reload the the existing one from that I exported as a, as a CSV file. And so at that point, I'm getting all my old stuff and then Michelle's new stuff. The only thing that might change is, which probably won't, is the actual uh, like C full name, did that change? Right. Most likely, no. Right, so for ACT, we are committed to keeping our paths the same. So we will have additional paths, but right. the existing paths should stay the same. So I guess 
that mechanism would work if you're doing it with ACK. I don't know, but I don't know if it's like totally generalizable, but I guess the thing would be you would create where those new concepts would be intermingled in the path, but you would, I'm gonna keep my paths the same, so you would not be in danger of me stepping on it, as long as you make a unique um, path. Yeah, okay. So if we add the customized ones to the existing act ontology, are we, how are we going to change the mapping table? Well, so the local stuff is only gonna be in an I2B2 ontology. Locally. So in if you're like in the act network and you're enshrined, you will not see that local stuff. Customized because you stuff. can't. Okay. You, right. Yeah, if it's a child, it will the numbers will get swept up, but the concepts will not be visible because the network ontologies need to be the same, right? So because if I were to pick, you know, Kansas concept, nobody else would have that. So so that's why like when you see the one that I had for like um, for Corey and yeah, so so when you look at these ontologies, the stuff in the gray would be in a local I2B2 ontology because those are like OMOP concepts or Bakuri locations, but you would only in, see in your shrine, you would only see the stuff that's in the formal ACT ontology. But your local ontology can have all these other things um, and they, in your local I2B2 you can see them, but you won't be able to see them. Right, so that's what I said, so for that. But, uh, stop. Well, the ACT ontology is actually a shrine ontology, so it is the same in everybody's, and it's not in, I mean, one of the discussions we were gonna have was that a shrine ontology now is in a Lucene index, and so it, it's gonna be just exactly ACT. You wouldn't be able to do that through the shrine network, because the problem is they don't wanna see a bunch of failures, right? Okay. So you'd have you and Duke would answer the question, and you'd have 52 other failures. They don't want the network to look like that, right? So yeah, that's round one. <laughs> yes. So I think it's on now. Okay. So one um, one issue that we're currently wrestling with at Ocean um, is similar to what Michael uh, brought up regarding. Um, regarding granularity and also kind of reflects uh, my view, which you brought up regarding uh, how the, the ontology has been a standards driven thing. But from the user experience, for example, if we're looking for, um, if we have an obfuscated user who's trying to find all patients with an elevated A1C um, in the ACT ontology and the OCEAN data set, um, well, first of all, for the ACT ontology, I think there's about 10 different uh, links for that. Not um, my fault. And in our OCEAN data set, we have about four um, of those terms that are actually populated. But for obfuscated users, what they're presented in the search tree is all 10 of those, um, uh, of those loading codes. And that creates, has created some usability challenges. I'm kind of curious how others have addressed this, if this is a problem for others, and what are the solutions might be. I don't, um, I'm not sure if I'm interpreting it correctly, but the notion of um, derived concept or de derived, uh, what was that? Uh, derived. Uh, concepts, yeah. Yeah, derived concepts. Um, if that's something that could be applied here, then the question becomes, you know, what, what is the hierarchy for these derived concepts? But it's a big challenge for, for the user yeah. experience. So I guess one of the things we could kind of do um, is, like I wish Jeff was here, because for a network level, if we knew what individual concepts actually had facts 
beneath them. We could, um, I think in the loin ontology, we have those LP levels and perhaps what it should be, maybe that would take a I2B to change, but being able to apply the metadata at the LP level and then a site roll up their, you know, all those individual loins that so are equivalent. Roll ups, roll ups is what we ended up doing in Trinetics. Um, we did them a long time ago, but now there is this thing called loink groups, mm -hmm. LG codes. Okay. And I always found loink hierarchy to be particularly useless. Nobody, it's, no, right, you, it's I, tough. You don't want to, you know, like, you don't want to navigate it. It's, mm -hmm. it, it truly is kind of useless. Mm -hmm. In fact, Harvard Demo Ontology for Labs is much friendlier. <laughs> uh, but they don't think it's maintained. Right. Um, so loink groups, there's this, so for example, loink will have a code potassium in serum or plasma. It will have a code potassium in blood. And then inexplicably, it will also have a code potassium in serum, plasma, or blood. And when you see those three, you know, your hair stands up on end and you're like, I don't want my users to deal with that. You roll them up into one. And as soon as you do that, a laboratory pathology informaticist pops up out of nowhere <laughs> and says, do you know that it's different. if you measure it in blood, it's like 3% <laughs> different. Right. Well, and the other thing is, is I think with each of those links, they do tend to have default units of measure, which may be different underneath a mm -hmm. given folder. So, so I'm, it's a much bigger project. To roll them up, they have to be comparable. Uh, Loin groups, Loin groups puts them together algorithmically by the similarities of one of the seven, one or more of the seven axes of the standard. We have to pick the ones that work for I2B2, right? The, the measurement must be the same. Mm -hmm. And then those groups can be used, and they, they will certainly improve usability. You just have to figure out how to present them to the user. Right. So I think we have opportunities with the smaller lab, the, the most frequently used labs, to maybe tackle it from that point of view. But I mean, the big link ontology is would be a lot of work but I think we could yeah. as a working group probably work through the very common labs to come to some agreement of how we would code and apply the um, metadata for values to those that we agree upon so maybe that's what we do Michelle yes I, sir I think one thing you mentioned there was having the equivalent of the total num yeah. um, they don't have that in shrine but I guess they could pull the total numbers at all the sites. You'd have to add that. Yeah. To the, so we do have Jeff said here, but we do have a project where we're trying to get everyone to start running their total numbers so that we can figure out how to harmonize concepts that have people have values, right? Some some links everybody uses the same thing. Some other ones, you know, you'd get this big range. But at least we'd be able to see what is the overlap. Jeff, uh, I think in the next session is going to present some of that information to show, because he did start it. I think about 11 sites started with that process. Of he, we sent all our total nums to Jeff, and he's you know, showing what the overlap is, showing what our usage, because I mean, there's a million concepts in there. there most queries are doing the exact same thing every time, right? Right. Right, so that's kind of one of the things that we're hoping to yeah, do. I, I would like yeah. to chime in this. This yeah. is exactly what we did for, for our um, prior oh, presentation guide on, on labs. Uh, so we actually just asked for total nouns and came up with the top 300 codes. It was only 300 covering 80% of right. our labs. Right. So this was a huge success. And this is absolutely doable because um, otherwise the loin codes are assigned by the manufacturer of the lab test into liquid chemistry. So in the, the moment they deliver another one, you got another loin code. So right. that's quite, quite a difference. But so, indeed, yeah, just to make it easy, top 300 mm -hmm. was good enough. Yeah. Can you explain how the FIRE implementation works? How you're... It's just an implementation guide. Uh, then you come up, this is a lab test. Um, this is the assigned loin code to the lab test per se. And you say this is the order, uh, this is the... Uh, yeah, and you just go down, this is the unit, this is the measurement. Uh, it's human readable. But when readable, you say so FIRE, is, is, is 
When you're doing a query in ITV2, is it actually doing a Firefox? No, actually we're not, we're not using ITV2 in that project. That's, uh, that's a pity. Oh, okay. Because uh, you know, those, those fire queries are not really performing. But I, I'm talking about the information model. The information, just, okay, yeah. okay. I just wasn't sure if you had yeah. like something really fancy going on yet. No, not no, yet. nothing fancy. <laughs> All right, cool. So in regards to the total num, so there's been a little discussion on the next version of ITV2 basically creating kind of cron jobs. And right. the idea was these cron jobs would run at night when the load was very low. Some of the cron jobs could be that we talked about derived data and even the total nums. So that it would re so if you did do derived data, your total nums are now going to be low because you just derived the data. So uh, it will run the total nums, and then at that point, you'll have always up-to-date total nums. Right. Um, yeah, so Mike is planning to build that into one, what was that new version? I guess it's one. 1.8. 1. 1.8, 1. which is early next year. <laughs> early next year. I still call it 2020. <laughs> yeah, when he, when he wrote it, I was like, I'm not waiting that long, but we'll see. <laughs> yeah, so we were we did have a discussion about one of the things that happens, I know in ACT, is that we call stuff plugin, and then people don't install it. So we had a discussion about, let's be a little more proactive. Like, we could just install the stuff in the I2V2 version, and then people might play with it and go ahead and use it like the ontology store. If I say, OK, can you please install the ontology store? And so you're not going to do it, right? It was already in there. You might play with it and try it. So that's one of the things we were trying to think of how we can be more proactive and features that we want people to use, like running their total nums or ontology store, have that stuff already built into the ITV2 version so that even if it is in a plugin structure, it is available for people without extra effort. So that's the, what we're trying to do is make it more sustainable so that uh, people can use features that are available without doing extra work. So Michelle, I know one of the things that you, I think, well, you, we wanted to get out of the session was sort of what might some directions be for the upcoming, say, year. Right. So I guess I'm wondering, are there things that are sort of sticking out, things that are sort of resonating with the group as some of the more valuable efforts the work group might take? Anything popping out to you or anyone else? Um, I mean, I can add. <clears throat> so, uh-oh. Uh, Mark Abajian, USC. Okay. Thank you, sir. <laughs> for enforcing the mic. Go ahead. So we're looking at getting genomic data into ITV2. Uh, of course, then once you get it in there, you're going to have to query it. So I mean, I'd like to work with you, Michelle, on figuring out a good ontology for genomic leaks. Yeah. I know the BioBank has one, but it's very simple. It's like five or six terms. What is that what we need? It, maybe right. that's all we need, but if there's something more elaborate that's useful, then, mm -hmm. because this is an area that I have very little knowledge on. Okay. <laughs> we will have that on the list. Start, sign, him sign him up. The other thing, I think with the genetic data, though, is uh, what type of representation do we have on the back end for it? Are they just <sighs> lists of genes? Or is it something a little bit more flexible? I think which might be in Victor or Hussein's yeah, bundle? Yeah, they've done some stuff with that. Yeah. Um, I've learned uh, from them how to load up like 50,000 genomes. Right. Uh, but yeah, it's, uh, that's actually something we'll talk about next hour. Next one. Yeah, but that's the thing. So. The gene thing, I think we all we have to be cognizant of. It's so much data. Um, how are we representing it? And again, for the ontology, like you know, I have one little one at back at Pitt where I just put an alphabetic list A through Z, and then if your gene is an A starting gene, you pick it like that. But you can also do like I think in the bundles they use the metadata more so, where you can kind of type in what the gene name is, and yeah. then it does it that way. Yeah, we, we, we did it in a very basic, there was a gene, there's a folder called variants, mm -hmm. and inside are individual mutations, like D600E or whatever, KRAS, BRAS, I can't remember. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the only 
another element to support is location of the biopsy. You know, was it taken from a tumor in the lung or the thyroid? That's it. Yeah. And your users are are okay with that representation? They're, they're almost okay with it. They're now, now that cancer generation seems doing more and more structural variants, at the number of variation, fusions, translocations, blah blah blah, inversions, they want more of that. But for basic stuff, you know, like SNPs. Mm -hmm. You send us a link. Okay. Thank you. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. <coughs> Excuse me. Good morning. Can you hear me? Okay. So, um, <coughs> Michelle, thank you very much for putting this together. Um, uh, my name is Mark Abajian, late of University of Southern California. I've just retired from there, but I was working as a sysadmin for ITB2 and Shrine for the past four years. Um, one thing I'd like to um, share with there's two things I'd like to share with the group. Number one. For those of us who, uh, for those of you who are on Zoom, um, thank you for joining our our sessions today and yesterday. I just want to let you know that you missed an absolutely delightful group dinner <laughs> yesterday at the Yard House here in Boston. So, just one reminder of why of another reason to join us in person. Michelle, I wanted to mention to you and uh, to the group here that um, I'd like to announced something, it's a new product from University of Southern California. It's our uh, social and environmental determinants of health, ontology, and a toolkit for gathering the data. And so you know that, for example, in ICD-10, there, uh, there are codes in there for marking a uh, person's, uh, a patient's exposure to certain uh, disease or They've had um, smoking, um, they live in, in a smoking household or something like that. Um, but I couldn't, we could not find anything that was a standard for exposures in the outside world. For example, there's lots of information from the American Community Survey, ACS, or from the USDA or other places. Um, and what we've done is we've put together a toolkit for gathering this information for, um, and this is divided by, uh, by census tracts all over the United States, as far as I know. Uh, we've been collecting information specifically for Southern California, but I, but I believe it exists in um, uh, government databases for all over the United States. Um, and in the toolkit, we're able to take patient addresses from our EMR. We get take the addresses and unidentified, um, de-identified patients, send those addresses to a, uh, a uh, geolocator uh, mapper, and um, get uh, and then match those up with census tracts. Bring in the data from the different census tract from the ACS survey, for example, uh, American Community Survey, and match those values up. Match those for and there's different things. For example, um, uh, vulnerability index, uh, uh, percentage of um, unemployed people in the neighborhood. Um, that type of thing. There's, we have 38 different items that, we're, um, that we collect data for. Match those data up with the patient's addresses and then add those into our um, I2B2 database so that our researchers can look for social and environmental determinants of health that are associated with the localities where our patients uh, live. Okay. And uh, we're working to do this his historically also, not only for the latest ACS data, but for, um, for older ACS data, because patients do move around and you have uh, historical addresses for them. So I want to invite you to investigate um, a project that we have called our GIS Toolkit for Sunday. I forget what this Sunday stands for. It's S-E-N-D-A-E. -E. It's on GitHub. I don't know the exact address, but if you'd like to um, reach out to me, I'll be happy to connect you with the people at USC who are responsible for this. We're doing beta testing right now. And, um, and so uh, I think that it's something that could be useful for other institutions where researchers want to be able to get social and environmental determinants of health for their patient base. Cool. Thank very you cool. very much for letting yeah. me share that. And we'll put it on our 
you know, our, our little resource list too. Thank you. Cool. Mm -hmm. So we're coming up on the end of the hour. I guess this would probably be a good time to invite folks to <laughs> bring this energy to one of our working group sessions too. Yeah. So just a reminder of when that is. So our working group, so here's the people who drop in and out uh, on occasion. And this is all our information. We meet the third Thursday of every month on Zoom. And um, it's a good group. We have a lot of good discussions. Um, and I think we're being somewhat productive. So uh, we invite all of you to join us and bring your ideas. And if you've got tools you want to share, we love people to demo their stuff. Um, yeah, that's it. But yeah, I mean, it's exciting. I think some of this conversation will probably end up informing maybe some of what we work on for in sure. the upcoming year. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and we definitely want to get this metadata um, management kind of documentation, best practices, challenges. We want to, that's what we really want to get that together. Go ahead. I have one question. Um, do you have any future plans of adding registry information to ontologies? Like NACER, for example, is one of the widely used ontologies in our local I2B2. Mm -hmm. And uh, currently we are making, we're participating in this pick on a trial called NETRO as part of it. Um, we line mapped pretty much all of the NACER terms and uh, we are building a tumor table for pick or net CDM. So I was just wondering are there any efforts or plans made to bring have registry? Any plans, in? But if you want to come join us, we would love to, you know, we'll help and just help distribute and, you know, help uh, build it. Sure. So I have a follow up question. So, mm -hmm. in PicoNet CDM world, that is called Ops Gen Table. Right. So, where you can park everything else. So, do you have a plan to create like guidelines for if you? Three sites want to participate on that specific ontology. Just park all the ontologies here. Park, park all the, all the, you mean park all the facts? All the new ontologies. For example, if let's say Harvard and Kansas wants to do uh, work on NASA, uh -huh. and the, the guidelines will be oh, just parking off gen ontology or something like that. Oh, okay. Um, I don't know. It's, it's like it's network inside a network. Yeah, I don't know. Anybody have thoughts? Yeah. Why don't you come and and then we can come That's to one kind of our of things. What we did on the Picornet side as mm -hmm. well. Like, did you build a ITB2 ontology for that? No. No. But we parked everything else. Obgen. Obgen. Right, and that's why, like, when you see on that ontology, so I find Obgen to be a very awkward table as far as, because you don't know what's going to be in there. It could have, it, it basically accepts all vocabs, right? You could put CPTs, LOINCs, ICDs, which makes the data less findable in my perspective. So, and it's probably one of the things that will kind of, um, when you see that, uh, act over PCORI ontology that I built, I have to, because the way that PCORI is built, allowing um, all these different vocabs in a bunch of different tables. So when I'm going to search for an ICD, I'm going to search OBSGEN. I'm going to search the, uh, what's the one that begins with a C in the diagnosis table? What's the one that begins with a C? Conditions. Right. So I have to search all three to find that ICD, which, you know, it makes stuff less findable and it makes the query run a lot slower because now I got to go here, here, and here and looking for it. That's the beauty of I2B2, right? You really don't have to do that. It's all in the same place. You go one place, it's indexed. But um, so that's what I'm saying. Like, OBSGEN is like garbage can. Could I call it that? It's basically like a fat garbage can. Like, everything you don't know where it should go, you throw it in there. I think. OMOP has the same concept in their observation table. You'll know where stuff goes, throw it in observation. Um, so for me, that's why I like ITB, because everything's in the same garbage can. Um, I don't know. I, 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 come to work group, and maybe we'll work through that and see if there's something we could do. But again, I would probably end up searching all of those tables just in case 
everybody's not following the regulations because everybody doesn't follow regulations. I work on N I work in N3C, and I will tell you, nobody's following the regulations. So um, it's an interesting problem. Some, some even follow it even worse. So that's, <laughs> so that's it. All right. All right. So can we have a round of applause for Michelle?